good. Yeah, that was really good. I hope you all paid attention to that. <laughs> I was like taking that picture. Yeah. What's up, everybody? Thanks for listening to another episode of Seeking Wisdom. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the whole Drift team went down to Austin, Texas to do a little offsite hangout for a couple days. And while we were down there, uh, David and I went over to visit Noah Kagan and the crew over at AppSumo. And uh, we hung out with Noah for about an hour, recorded a podcast that was all over the map, talked about learning, favorite books, what David and Noah do in the morning, the things most startups get wrong, and a bunch of other stuff. I think you're going to enjoy this one. Uh, so here it is. Uh, here is David Cancel and Noah Kagan on Seeking Wisdom. What's, what's the number one thing that people get wrong with startups? Throw out marketing. Just say, like, with a startup. There are, the, the most obvious thing that I was just talking to someone on the phone about this, the, the number one immediate thing is they don't make money. <laughs> That's the most immediate thing. It's a business, yeah. not a nonprofit. And everyone's like, they, everyone plays business. This is what a friend of Ryan told me. It's like, everyone's playing business. They get a tool. They're using all these tools. They're reading all these blog posts. But they're not actually trying to make money. Right. And so it's like, how do they accelerate that time or minimize that time to actually get money and validate that someone wants the idea, service, or product that they're building? Is that a product of like just this culture, like this startup culture where it's like, oh, you don't have to make, you don't have to make money on day one? Whereas like if you started like a hardware store and you didn't make money, you'd be like, fuck, I'm, I'm out of business. <laughs> yeah, good question. I don't know. My answer was going to be similar, which is like uh, mental did I just, masturbation. Did I just you know? steal your <laughs> no, 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 just like, so no. I stole David's answer. Yeah, yeah. I want to apologize to everyone listening. Yeah, just like mental masturbation, whether it's like reading or doing or not starting or starting and then playing and like just not realizing that it's a business and that you have a timeline and that, um, you know, whether you like – bootstrap it or self-fund it or you're on the other extreme and you raise money not knowing that it is a business right and so even on the extreme end of people who raise a lot of money talk to so many of them and they don't realize that they have to return money someday right <laughs> like that that's the flip side of that equation like someone's yeah. expecting money right but the the problem with everyone listening i don't know is it a podcast or yeah. what is this called? yeah, yeah. a podcast yeah. yeah okay wow it's a pod and a cast okay yeah so <laughs> the thing that uh what is it? You never, have you never heard of it? no this this new technology <laughs> yeah i'm still on tapes. tapes so here's the thing that's crazy david and i think yeah. you've noticed this you've seen hundreds of people you started many successful companies um i hope we're recording this too because we, we had some really good stuff you guys all missed out on that's right um, is it here's the problem though everyone thinks their business idea is the unique one. Oh yeah that's the problem everyone listening is like David and Noah don't know shit. Even though they started a few very successful companies, like they don't know anything. My idea needs funding. Uh, my not even just funding. My idea needs to be built. My totally. idea needs time. Yeah. I'm the one that's going to go opposite of a lot of things that are successful. And a lot of the most successful companies that we admire now, like basically started without a lot of money, without a lot of capital. Let's go through it. Dell, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. Yep. Even I think Amazon was self funded from the beginning. He self has, uh, he raised money from his parents. And but a lot of those companies started yeah. out small, didn't have, use a lot of money, made sure it was validated with the customer, mm -hmm. and then they went and expanded and make it like you know ten years later mm -hmm. uh, a successful company. But yeah. you are not the unique one. I, I think I just want to burst everyone's bubble. Yeah. Like you'll get a dollar from someone. <laughs> I'll tell you, dude, you ever get in your? Who was your first like? What's the first customer payment you got in, in the past companies that you're like, okay, it's real? Yeah, as soon as someone gave me. Physical money. Do you remember? Anyone? Oh yeah, uh, their names. No, not any ones or company like. Oh, uh, totally. Even at this uh, at Drift and then at Performable, uh, just going out and selling someone and getting them to give us ten bucks and just who's, sign their name on. Who's the first bucks. Drift? Who's the first Drift customer? Uh, we had a, we had a couple. We had um, Price Intelligently. I don't know if you know. Oh Patrick. really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Patrick, pretty early. How did that happen? We knew him. We just went to him. You know, and what we you knew him locally. Hey, here's what we're working on. Blah, blah, blah. We're working on, uh, you know, he's he's helping on the retention side. We're helping on understanding customers and, like, how do you keep customers and how do you know what the hell they're doing and how do you, up, more importantly, how do you upsell those customers? Yeah. And so do you want to do anything? It's like, yep. Yeah, all right. Give us whatever it was, 10 bucks, 20 bucks. I don't remember what the dollar was. Is that really, you had, like, just, why didn't you give it to him for free? That's your boy. Dude, he's your boy. It's your boy? Because <laughs> you got to validate. Right? You validate. Because at Performable, we learned this thing, which was, um, I think we used to call it dollar test or something like that, which was, like, it was mostly on asking for new features. This was past the point that they were already paying us and just saying someone would ask for new mm -hmm. shit, more shit, more shit, more shit. And we, at one point, we were just like, okay, it's going to be $5 more a month or whatever it was. And we were just making shit up. And, yeah. uh, and then we noticed that almost no one would come back and say like, 
they basically would say, oh, okay, no, uh, let me get back to you. I need to talk to John in the office, whatever. We need that, though. It's critical. Uh, okay, $5. Then time would pass and be like, they never came back. They're paying us already. Yeah. They never came back for a $5 thing. And so we just kept doing that over and over. No one would come back. And basically, you put a price on something. So they wouldn't want it at that point? Or they would want They it? wouldn't care enough, right? Because when it's free, it's easy to say, I want that. No, give me this. Give me yeah. that. Give me that. The minute that you say, give me a dollar for it, it's like, mm, let me think about it. Well, you find out how important it really is. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. I think about that. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm going to do that. Yeah. So even on existing customers, right? Like, yeah. Or you, you said like the, just the difference between asking going from nothing to just a dollar is like some type of decision needs to be made. Totally. I bet. So try it. Yeah. yeah. I like that one. All right. What's, uh, you start this one. Okay. What's the number one, what's the best thing you've done selfishly for your own career or like personal development? What's the best thing? Uh, not giving, not giving a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Number one. But did that, did that start like that's. It's easier for you to say that now because you've had some success. No, like, it was the beginning. You said just, I don't give a fuck from day one. No, it was, no, it was, was be, no, it was basically like I had nothing to lose, right? Like I feel like so many people have something to lose did either. Grow, how did you get to that? Did you like grow up poor or something? Yeah, yeah. I grew, you know, I grew up low income. income. Oh, okay. okay. I grew up low income. My, how much is low income? I don't know how much my parents made. You know, okay. like, uh, but my mom, mom and dad both emigrated to U.S. Okay. My mom was like a seamstress, you know, worked out of her house. Yeah. Uh, and my dad did like construction stuff. Hmm. And so like, uh, I don't know what they were actually earning at that point, but, uh, we lived in a kind of middle-class neighborhood by accident, but like, uh, we were like lower, uh, income. Hmm. And so I basically didn't have anything to lose. Right. Like, and I felt like everyone who was around, I didn't know this at, the, at that time, but everyone who was around me had something to lose. They went to a particular school. Their parents, you know, expected them to do to make X amount of money, right? They had this kind of lifestyle thing, and it was just like I didn't have anything to lose. And How so, did you get that motivation to get that that young age? Because I think yeah, I, I, there's both sides. I've seen where they don't, they can't progress with it, and mm-hmm. someone like yourself comes up big time. Yeah, I, for me, it was. Uh, I think it's. I have. No, I don't know, but I think it's just being around my parents. Work seven days a week. That was my normal, right? Mm-hmm. And. It wasn't like oh, we're working a lot. It was they were doing what they were interested in doing, right? My mom was sewing, my dad was building stuff. That's what they were passionate about, and they worked seven days a week. But they were always there for us. So I grew up around that, and then I grew up uh, being bored in school and wanting to like as soon as I could work, I would just like to do any job, work in a supermarket, work in a warehouse, work in whatever, and then I could see like I guess now you call it mastery of that. Like I was willing. I started to notice like, oh, I could work harder than other people or I could do more than other, other people would quit before I quit. I didn't know this kind of going into it, but you just start seeing that pattern over and over. And, uh, and then that developed like, okay, I'm good at this. Uh, I have nothing to lose. If I fail, what's the worst thing that would happen? Nothing. Right. So with, with that in mind too, you sold now two companies or three, maybe more than I even realized. Four. Four. Jesus. Uh, how do you keep that? How do you maintain that type of like tenacity or nothing to lose kind of not, is it just ingrained at this point or like, how do you maintain it after you? No, I think I go back and I'm like constantly oscillating between two ends, which is before we started recording this, we were talking about books that we like. And we, I was saying, uh, made in America, which is Sam Walton book. And this is back to your question there. Why I probably end up rereading it all the time, which is like, you feel like you, you progress, you have, you know, you put some points on the board and then you start getting wild and then I reread that book and, and read about him being the richest man in the world and uh, driving a pickup truck and working seven days a week. And then I'm like, shit, I got to get back on track, all right? Like, go back to the other extreme. It's almost like the other thing that we were talking about before we started, cutting and bulking, right? Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. You're going back from either extreme and you're hoping to, in the middle, be pretty good. But you're oscillating between these two ends. So I think that's how I do it. You know, not only that book, but I go extreme back the other end. And maybe yeah. that's what you're doing with downsizing, new apartments, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Interesting stuff. What's your thing? For selfish. Oh, that been super selfish. Um, I think two things. You know what I hate when people are like, hey, A or B and like C. C. <laughs> but, but I think at the same time. This thing is, you ask, you're like, should we be doing this or that? And he goes, both. Like yeah. Always, yeah. Always. That's well, the I think joke. there's something there where, like, um, if you're starting a business, you're basically doing something that hasn't been done. So it's proving something that like can't hasn't been proven. So of course, of course there's a uh, problem. So I think mindset is like, mm-hmm. I've, lately I'm just trying to get even better myself at it. Like, what's the solution? 
Because we all have problems. Every day there's a problem. Mm-hmm. This person thing, and you're, you default to be like, oh, this won't work. Mm-hmm. Or this person's this. But then you're like, well, okay, let me. So I'm just trying to keep reminding myself what's that solution or what, what is the solution. So selfishly, think two things that have helped me. Number one was being at Facebook. So I was only there a little bit of time. I was fired. There's a story online. There's a book on Amazon. It's free. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the biggest takeaway from that, uh, and I just cold emailed to get the job. I submitted my resume was being around better people. Mm-hmm. And and here's how you know you're around better people. And if you're not feeling uncomfortable, you're not around better people. Because people everyone thinks everyone thinks they have good friends. Mm-hmm. No one thinks their friends suck. Mm-hmm. Unless I mean maybe a few. But everyone's like, oh all the people are smart. I'm around good people. But are you actually uncomfortable with how they are around you? And mm-hmm. I think that's how you know you're around better people. Because you're like, yeah, that was a really good idea. Okay, that guy's got a good idea. This girl's really smart. And then it kind of pushes you. Like I probably grew the most selfishly just being around like the guy who designed Napster. Zuckerberg, project managers, guys who are now running Dropbox, guys who started Quora. Mm-hmm. Um, so being around people that were honestly just on another level, like and if you don't know that person, ask someone impressive who they know that's impressive, and you can always find someone, even if you're in Ohio or like in a foreign country. Uh, the second thing that was like super selfish, and it wasn't intentional, but now in retrospect, I encourage anyone who's younger, uh, starting out maybe in your twenties or even in college or high school, put on events. Selfishly, that was the greatest way that I've ever connected with people. And like, I had, I got access to everyone. Max Levchin of PayPal, James Hong Hot or Not, Suicide Girls, Plenty of Fish, Guy Kawasaki, um, Aaron Orrin Hoffman, Tim Ferriss, like all these people that I was able to connect with was only because I started becoming a hub and connecting people through online, but mostly offline conferences and small mm-hmm. meetups. So if you're in a small city, do it online. If you're in a bigger city, like pay for the dinner. It'll probably be one of the best investments you can do. Yeah. But so like the facilitator of these and they all look back to you. So like even this morning, there's two guys who are doing product, you know, VPs of product at very large companies in LA and I put them together and it wasn't Mm -hmm. self, it's not intentionally selfishly, but ultimately they're like, Oh cool. Noah too. But I want them to form a strong relationship and everyone kind of comes back to like, who's the hub and spoke around that. Mm -hmm. We talk about role models all the time Mm -hmm. and uh, just how people like people think a role model needs to be like some person or name that like you, you know, look like a specific person like an think idol. about every day. Yeah, yeah. But it's really just what you said, which is like just role models are the people that you could surround yourself with. Can you learn this from this person? And totally. Yeah. And so how do you keep that now? Especially now that you move from the Bay Area to Austin. Yeah. Probably well, big not, fish here. It's a different experience, right? And I've gone through phases. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what a lot of people have to do is like look back on what's got this is one thing I talk about my friends. You have to look back on what's gotten you successful. Mm-hmm. And then keep doing it. Yes. A lot of times what we do, and it's kind of coming back to not having anything to lose, is you're like, man, I got really, this was really good. I did all this stuff. Like maybe you're doing paid marketing. Yeah. And you're like, ah, oh, just turn down the paid marketing. And then six months later, like, why is your business down? Because we stopped doing the paid marketing. <laughs> we uh, talk about that every, every time. Every day. Every That's day. all the fucking time. And so for me, um, uh, what I do with Austin is I've realized that a lot of my satisfaction and fulfillment in life um, comes being around, comes from being around inspired people. Mm. Just coming, kind of hearing your story. Like mm-hmm. I didn't, I never heard that stuff. And mm-hmm. It's actually amazing because hearing more of your story makes me even like you more. <laughs> but, I mean, I just don't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it makes I sense. You. It makes um, sense. And so what I do is two things intentionally. So one, I'll move just my physical location. Mm. So in my calendar, if you go on my calendar, it says move location every three months. It's on auto repeat. It just Crazy. every three months, it's like change location. It's not that just always uh, have to move consistently, but it's like I know that I'm inspired in new places. So I live in Austin, it's smaller. Yeah. So instead of making an excuse like I'm in Austin, there's no one around me, I go and fly. Last week I was in LA. Next week I'm going to Seattle. Yeah. And then two months ago, I was in San Francisco. And I go out of my way, even though I'm like, oh, I don't really want to go. I have my girlfriend here. I got a yeah. good lifestyle here. I go because I know it serves me and it's what served me in the past. Mm-hmm. Second thing is, and I'm, this is I'm not always great at, but it's just proactively trying to meet new people mm. um, from the people who I already know. Even here? Beyond? In here? Yeah. yeah. Um, here as well as like everywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, I think a lot of people, I don't know, I get a lot of inspiration. So it's like what people... I think for a lot of people who are maybe even starting out or listening to the podcast, like yeah. maybe you're starting out or you have a successful business, the easiest thing to do is who are you already admiring that you like have access to or who do you want to replicate? So if you're starting a business, whose business is like doing really well? Mm-hmm. Obviously, you don't like if you go to someone big, start with one of their junior people, yep. right? But mm-hmm. those people are pretty accessible. And so if there's someone you're admiring, reach out to them or find someone who knows them. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things, like I'm going to Seattle. So a buddy of mine runs Outreach.io. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it. Uh, so Manny's a good buddy. Not a great buddy, but good buddy. Mm-hmm. And so I asked him, I'm like, hey, we're not, let's go have drinks. My treat. Mm-hmm. Just one drink. Um, you treat <laughs> the rest. I always treat the first one. <laughs> they, they keep doing it afterwards. Yeah. yeah. But then I said, like, who's one person that's interesting that you could bring? Yep. 
And I did this last week in LA. I met Larry Brown at sports.com. Larry Brown is awesome. And he read Kyrie, Kylie. Uh, and Kylie was just like the super interesting guy. And so that expanded my network, but it also expanded my like inspiration. So my two points, I'd, I'd say, uh, how do you get the most out of being in like a non-major city? Mm-hmm. One, move to a major city. Yeah, the, the, There's a reason that everyone's there. It's like, you know, if you're trying to do movies, you go to Hollywood. Um, mm-hmm. So, But if you're not, or you're limited by family or mm-hmm. finances, you know, do it virtually. And then, so physically, like, try to do it, try, or do it virtually, and then try to meet the certain people that uh, you think would inspire and admire you. Yep. Makes sense. You guys both are kind of creatures of habit. Uh, or you just have, like, you have things that you do often. Do you what, sense that? I sense that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I will, yeah. What's your, uh, you start this one. What's your... How do you start? Because when you say you start this one, they have no idea who's. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they'll know next. They'll know next. No, no. They'll know when they hear my voice, yeah. yeah, you, David. Yeah. So, uh, what's your morning routine like? How do you mm-hmm. how do you start every day? Yeah. So uh, I've been doing it for the for the last year. I've been doing this experiment where I start every morning the same way. So I do yoga for like twenty minutes. Right. Very simple routine. I had never done yoga before. So I do yoga, then I read, a book, and uh, a certain amount. Then um, after that, then my kids are waking up usually, and so what I'm time do you get up? Five. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> what time do you get up? Six thirty. Oh my god! You yeah. get up so early. Yeah. So I get up at five. It's the only way I can do it with kids, right? Yeah. And so then my kids get up, and then I hang with them. I make so my thing is like I want to spend mornings with my kids because uh, I'm never almost never there at night, you know, okay. at nighttime because there's always something going on. So spend time with them. Uh, then drink coffee. Then I'm finally checking, you know, email or whatever, how just catching you, up. How do you resist that temptation? So fucking hard, dude. It's so hard. <laughs> this is like this is like the Buddhist meditation. This is like the meditation, man. I'm just like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't touch it, don't touch it. It's so hard. Uh, and so that's what that's been the experiment. More yeah. than anything, more than the yoga, more than the reading, it's been like resisting, totally. like trying to be intentional about the day instead of just. I just wanted to see, like, was there. Was there a real difference between starting each day the way that I was, which was like reacting to, to shit that's just going on, versus like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna proactive. ignore that, be proactive, and then I'll get to the reactive stuff on my schedule. And I just want to see like, was there a real hmm. difference? Did you and start noticing a difference? Huge difference for me, just in my um, in how calm I could re- maintain, right? like, and also my. Uh, <laughs> Can you remain calm? Yeah, remain calm. Remain right, calm. Sorry, he's recording the podcast thing. <laughs> and Just for make calm. Never make calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. Say hello. Yeah. Hello. This is Anton. He's a business that's doing me. Hey, yeah. Anton. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the other thing was just like feeling that I got something done that day hmm. went up, right? Because oh, I had time to think about what I was going to focus on that day versus like it was just easy to fall into just reacting to other people's stuff, right? What made you start it? Because you said you've been doing it now. You started and I'm a sure year ago. The previous ones? Yeah. But you remember around a year ago what triggered it or what you started? I'm trying to. I read. It was one one of the many books that I read somewhere around uh, being intentional. I can't mm-hmm. remember which book it was, but uh, this, uh, we've all read many many books that have the same message around being intentional, each yeah. starting each day with this. And I think it was a five minute journal kind of stuff, which okay. is part of my you know morning routine. So I journal like you know like stuff that I want to get done, stuff that I'm grateful for. You know, three things, three things. Uh, I think that led to it. You still I, do that? Yeah. Okay. Every morning. Yeah. Wow. So I do three things that I have to do before I do anything uh, reactive, which is beyond, of course, my kids are the most important if I'm home, but like uh, yoga, which is my form of meditation, reading, and then five minute journal. And I start the day. Dude, I love it. <laughs> I mean, one thing I, I think for myself, because like I, a lot of life, love is an evolution. You try new yeah. things, you add new things, you remove things. You didn't do those all at once. You didn't. You no. Know, I mean, you just go, no way. Like, do. So Not I think me. that for myself is for the listeners too. Like, I don't know if you noticed it, but like, he didn't just go hardcore. Like he's doing this like superhuman morning. Yeah. You yeah. know, he's drinking bulletproof coffee. Yeah. You know, he's meditating four hours. You know, <laughs> he's levitating was, and shit. Yeah. You know? I was doing the bulletproof before that. That was uh, a progression. But like, what'd you start with? And then did you remove anything? Is there anything you yeah. were doing? Yeah. Uh, I, um, well, I was, you know. I was doing Bulletproof. I was trying to work out before. So I was trying to work out before I started everything. And that was just becoming hard uh, to get up early enough to do it. I do that at a different time of day now. Mm-hmm. So uh, so I flipped the order of things. And I started with uh, the reading. Then I added the yoga before that. And then the five-minute journal kind of 
was before then, then I added back in. So I keep experimenting with these things. But it's a progression. You got to do one at a time. I mean, we were talking about tidying up before yeah. we started. And right now, I just, I've got these three things that I'm doing plus some other things. And uh, I just need all of those to be concrete before I can experiment with taking one out or adding something yeah. else. Yeah. I it's just it a stack. Great. No, I thought your stack was really interesting because, like, I was like, Dave, why don't you, t-? we were talking about like changing magic, tidying up, which I love. And I like read it and then, like, you know, I just threw away a lot of stuff uh, that doesn't really give me joy. Just mm-hmm. the book and, and I was like, Dave, why don't you do it? You've read the book. And he's like, you know, I'm already focused on these three things. And it's, you know, the glass is full thing we were talking yep. about. Now. Like, you can't pour more into a, a full glass. So mm-hmm. I like that. Um, it's interesting for you, too. Like, you started small, you're adding new things. Yeah. And then you're going to, like, keep kind of iterating them as you go. Yeah, and we'll see if I, if I can add more if I have to take stuff away. I think one thing that I've noticed just for myself, I don't have an amazing morning routine. Uh, I just do my, I do my own thing. Yeah. Um, I think it's also like, how do you make it hard for yourself to do mm-hmm. the things that you, that are like the reactive thing? Mm-hmm. Like email is like this, it's like Christmas morning every morning, mm-hmm. right? You're like, I, I always say this joke and no one ever laughs, which sucks. <laughs> but, you know, like, I'm always like, it's Christmas, or I guess it's Hanukkah morning. Yeah, right? Hanukkah but, morning. Woo! Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, all oh, these fucking people that, you know, stayed up late emailing me so they could have me respond to their shit. Uh, I think the two things I would say is like one with email and Instagram and social and now that there's access to the phone, you work around the clock. You don't mm-hmm. work it. Eight hours a day is, is bullshit now. It's like mm-hmm. eight hours around the whole day. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like how much of it is like, just think about it when you're doing it one day. This is what I try to do. Like how much of it is actually beneficial? Mm-hmm. Like in that morning, like how much is it beneficial versus getting my mind right? The other thing that, that I've tried to do is just like, how do I make it harder for myself to work yep. at home? So mm-hmm. I have a shitty computer at home. You do? Yeah, I intentionally what was it. It's a MacBook, but it's not, it's not a fast one. Yeah. yeah. Which to me, like, uh, the upstairs here in our office, like, at singlemy.com. Plug. Plug. Uh, <laughs> singlemy.com. Way to grow your website. Um, like, I have, like, a MacBook Pro, double circuit, GDR, DDR, RAM, like, top of the line, surf, like, drive, all this shit. But at home, I have, like, the smallest MacBook. Like, if I try to do two, more than one thing, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it helps me kind of at home. Like, I'm like, all right, well, I can't work as much. Mm-hmm. Isn't the battery like? Isn't well, I can plug it in, but like I basically try to set it up to make it harder for that. Yeah, I like right because like it's as my friend says, it's easier to run away from the dragon than to slay a dragon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the harder that it is to use my like, I don't have my phone in my bedroom. Uh, I generally don't use an alarm, so I want to wake up when I'm ready. Nice. I try to sleep in the dark, mm-hmm. um, but I do think there's times where like grab my phone and I just get on it, and then 15 minutes later in the morning, I'm like, there's just no benefit to this. No, yeah. and so I think so you don't bring it in your bedroom. I have it outside the bedroom. That's good. Um, I don't know, it works for me. And I think to your point for myself, it's a good reminder is like trying new things in the morning. Mm-hmm. So try not reading your email until you get to the office. Yeah. I don't even like your phone email until you get to the office. That's tough. No, I don't. The other pattern that I've fallen into. That Wait, you just the might... pattern. That's yeah, yeah. the thing, right? You wake up, you do this, you do this, you mm-hmm. do this. And then like, I think to my, like to my mom's detriment, this is the thing yeah. for her. My mom will keep doing things even though it's not good. For Most her. people will. Yeah, because they don't reevaluate it. Mm-hmm. And so the problem is you don't want to reevaluate every single moment and remove things. But I think there's some balance where you're like, I'm doing this bulletproof coffee. I miss eggs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I remember when I used to have eggs, I'm happier. So try it for a week. You have eggs, no bulletproof. Mm-hmm. And then evaluate. And this is, you know, I, I love like the eggs. experiments. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. try out these little experiments and see like, and I think for you, what was really fascinating was like, this made my day feel more, like I got more done. Yep. Yeah. I think the other thing that uh, when we were talking about things coming off the stack that I've given up is, uh, man, Email's been, I'm either, I've fallen into the, I used to answer all email, right? Back and try to answer all email back yeah. in the day. And now I'm like, uh, I basically don't answer almost any emails. So I, emails fall into two categories for me right now. Uh, either answered in 30 seconds or I never answer it. Hmm. If I don't answer it in 30 They'll seconds. They'll text you if they really want to. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, that's a, something about that, right? Which is just yeah. like, no, I'm not going to, re- you know, which is, uh, makes me a shitty person for not answering not emails, but like, I can't. This is the thing. People are cheap with your time. They're emailing you some, like, David, I need this thing. But 99% mm-hmm. don't follow up. Yep. Because they're cheap and they're lazy mm-hmm. and they don't actually want it. If they really wanted it, they'd follow up and email you until it actually, in a non annoying way, until it happened. Yep. The other thing that I, I thought in relation to this email, the amount of emails you get mm-hmm. is proportional to how many you send. Totally. If yep. you're fucking emailing a lot, you're going to have a lot of email. Mm-hmm. Like, if you don't respond to people, they're just like, well, not responding. And then the ones that really need to make it through, they'll text you, they'll call you, they'll snail mail you, they'll yep. like tweet you, and eventually they'll get it through. Get through. So. I believe it. A lot of people are like, um, I want to. How do you guys say no? Like when you do have to say no, do you just straight up say no? Like because a lot of people say, yeah, it's easy. I get email and I ignore it, but then I feel like a dick, or <laughs> I have to say no and I, you know, I feel terrible. Like how do you actually say no? 
So two things. One, Darmesh taught me. Mm-hmm. He says he's phone phobic. He is. So a lot of people want to do phone yeah. calls. Like, hey, let's do a f- quick 15 minute call. And I'm like, oh no, you know what? I'm, I'm f- I have a phone phobia. Uh, I can't. And now a lot of our generation has phone phobia, so it's a little more normal. Can you just email me your short, your question short? So that's number one. I'll use the Darmesh time that I love it. Two, I'll do TLDR. So if someone emails me, I'll just TLDR. I'm like, yo, it's too long, didn't read. Yeah. And I'll just respond with that. At the end of the day, like, it's my life. I don't get the time back. For sure. And I don't know if people actually calculate it, but I, I calculate. Like, take an email that even if I have to open it and move my mouse to delete it, mm-hmm. like, times that by how many emails a day, time, for everyone, not just me and David. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David's. Uh, yeah. But for everyone, like, that's months, years of life just responding to these people. So I don't mind saying TLDR. And then, honestly, the, the easiest one is instead of saying no, just delete it. Mm-hmm. Like, so I have some angry people, like, oh, blah, blah, just archive, delete. Like, oh, never got it. That yeah. sucks. We talk about um, like the sw- the the thing that sucks. The hardest part is the switching costs. Like you're doing something, you get an email, just sends you in a completely other direction. You don't just instantly get back in that groove. That's what I do now. If I don't reply, it's just deleted. It's just do you gone. keep your your email browser open? Your email, like Gmail or email? I do. So that's a good question because uh, I used to turn it off. Now I keep it open, kind of, um, and then try to resist it, which I it's usually hard, do. Man. It's hard though. It's, hard. Different tactics. Shut it down. it's tough. Like you can do different tactics of like remove it from your phone. Mm-hmm. I've never done that, but that'd be interesting. Or like you just don't have the tabs open slightly. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. when the tab, it's hard not to like. We're like I guess train for stimuli. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, what's the new present I got? <laughs> but like, how many? I, I, I think one thing I love to for people to think about themselves, like really think about it. And I'm doing it for myself too. Like, how many emails have you gotten today that really like changed your business? How many emails were like this? If you're a salesperson, that's maybe a different story. Yeah. But for a lot of other people, like how many emails did you open or respond to that you're like, oh my God, my business is so much more forward versus me doing something else? Yeah. None. None is the answer. <laughs> oh yeah. None no, today. No, unfortunately, it's yeah. very small. No, I've heard, I've talked to some people who've done like just auto respond. I've never gone the auto respond it's route. Like it sounds, you know, too I, know, I get a lot of emails. I'm not answering your, I have not read your email. Yeah. I just. So it's something it. funny about that. I thought it was so good. It's like, I think Chris Gillibo said it. He was like, all these people who say, uh, who have auto responders. They always encourage you to join their mailing list. Yeah. <laughs> and Chris Kett said that. And I was like, that's, that's true. true. That's genius. So true. That's genius. He's smart. What do you, what do you, all right, so you said like you, you try not to have work stuff at home, uh, email sucks. When you get work thoughts or like ideas, you know, about what you guys are doing here, for example, like where do those go? Do you write them down? Do you put I write them? everything down. My, the people I hate the most in the world, top three, okay, not most, yeah. top five maybe. Is that when you're like tell them something and they're like, oh, that's a, oh yeah, I should watch that. Oh yeah, we should do that. And I'm like waiting for them to get their phone out or yeah. look out. I'm like, I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're Chad, Chad, the CTO of Sumo.me.com, um, he doesn't write anything down, and he remembers everything, down, and he always follows through. So I write that. I use either like if it's a to do, I'll put it in remember the milk, and if it's like, I think the problem with a lot of businesses is like people give you a lot of ideas or you come up with a lot of suggestions. Mm-hmm. So I put those in like a buffer which is my notes folder. Yeah. And I just let it sit there for a, at least a few weeks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then if it like comes up again, then I'll probably go see it and remember it. A lot of times for me, just writing it down in my notes, uh, helps me makes it so you think of it comes up again because you got it out. I got it out. And then I like can think at a later time if it's important or not. And I'll put like things I don't really care about. Maybe I just want stored for the future. Like my lockbox code in Evernote. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the most important thing is just writing it down. So like it's critical just to write it down. And whatever system people have, people are old now. Yeah. Like they've got something they're, something they're all using. Yeah. I do something similar, which is just, I just write it in a note, but not, but I never read it. I almost never read it again. Mm-hmm. I just need to get it off. And then if it just keeps coming back up, either I can't get it out of my head or I just keep coming up with the same thought, then those are the things I usually pursue. How do you do it with product? And I don't know if we're going to product. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, let's do it. You're like the product expert. Like, no, no, no. Yeah. You're like, you, you saved HubSpot from bankruptcy, what I've heard. <laughs> I mean, I you've had compete.com, performable.com, you have new drift.com, which is yeah. going to do well. Um, how do you, you know, you have a lot of people, so you talk to customer meetings and they yeah. tell you, David, give us this. Mm-hmm. And then you guys have your internal meetings. Like, how do you filter that and then prioritize that? Mm, man. That's a fucking... No, I want to learn. You want to learn? I know that's a longer... That's a long question. Uh, Maybe it's like the highlight reel of the ESPN top 10 of that. Yeah. So usually when when I'm talking to people like prospective customer or like um, or current customer, I'm not... And they're just telling me, hey, man, hey, I need this, I need that, I need that, whatever. I'm not always listening to exactly what they're saying. I hear what they're saying. And I may write down what they're saying, but I'm trying to get to like what is what is the actual 
problem that they're having, and is it actually a problem? And so a lot of that is weird in that I'm just listening to what words that they're saying about, you know, what words they're using. Yeah. And I'm just trying to observe how they're, and then I try to get into like, well, how do you deal with that today? Well, I'm not dealing with that today. Okay, so maybe not really a, not really a problem. So let so me like, dig in there, right? They might say like, hey, uh, Noah, for sumo me, man, we really need fucking Pinterest integration. They do. That's what they say. Yeah, yeah. Non-stop. <laughs> they, say, they say, okay, keep yeah, going. Pinterest. I need Pinterest. need Pinterest. Oh, how much Pinterest stuff are you doing today? None. Okay, but I need Pinterest. Pinterest is the number one thing that I need. Okay, Pinterest, Pinterest. Okay, cool. And then you just keep going. So what else do you do? What are you doing each day? You know, show me your tabs. Show me what you're doing. Show me the problem that you're having. Show me your website. I'm just looking. And nothing has to do, you know, they're like B2B marketer who sells fucking pipes. And they're talking about fucking Pinterest. And it's just like Pinterest, Pinterest, Pinterest. Because that's like a... You know, lots of times people, when people are telling you about features, they talk about aspirational things. Like, oh, I aspire. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Like, I would love to be on the this, hot shit. But what do they actually need now? What do you actually need now? Yeah. Your job is not this, right? This is some aspirational thing. Like, I could talk all day about, like, abs. You know, we could talk about, like, abs, abs, abs. And maybe from a marketing standpoint, that's great because you can use that as a, as a lever on marketing. But if you ask me, okay, how often are you working on? Zero. I don't work at it at all. <laughs> How's your diet? It sucks. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And you're like... Uh, but I really need apps tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. But what do you do each day? Oh, you know, I sit on the couch, watch TV. Maybe I should build something better for TV and not, you know, apps. Hmm. Right? Because you're not going to use the app. apps. Or maybe I should just sell you some fake ad builder and then make money. And shake weight. Uh, shake weight. Yeah. <laughs> so for like, for like drift.com, like how has that evolved with product and you taking in inputs and deciding what you want for yourself? Like how has that evolved and like what have been some inflection points on, on those products? A couple inflection points. We started out, um, we started out talking to people mostly around uh, how are they communicating either to customers or internally, right? It was around customer communication. And so in the beginning, a lot of that shit started out like internal, like how you guys are talking about uh, customers that you're working with and like how do you take it in exactly what you're asking me, customer feedback on product ideas, how do you turn that in when you actually build something, how do you communicate that back to the customer, all that kind of stuff. And it was really internally focused. And so it had to do more with like how teams were communicating and but the more that we kept talking to people, the more that we saw like what they valued when we would talk to them was the communication that was going out to a customer. And you guys know this as stream of me, right? It was like the stuff that they were pushing out to customers, uh, either prospects or customers was the most important thing. It wasn't the internal dialogue as much because they had figured out some way to deal with that problem. And so like that those were inflection points for us. Like we were dealing around the same problem, but we were focused at the wrong end of the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, How do you then, recognize that? Because we, that's another good question. Um, because we saw them using our early stuff for both things, right? And so we were just trying to, kept asking, like, which one do you value most? Oh, both. You know, we value both. I do it in here, I do it in there. What other tools do you use for internal? Oh, I got Slack, I got this, I got that, I got a bunch of tools there. And I kind of, and I use Drift for some of that stuff. Uh, and then, uh, but, they basically told us after after a while, after enough people, like, oh, the most valuable thing is, like, when I send something out to a customer. Because that's part of my job, mm-hmm. right? My Part of my job for most of these people, these are, like... What mar- they're actually needing. Yeah. yeah. These, these were mostly, like, product marketers and product managers and stuff like that was, like, part of their job, the way that they were measured was, like, when they were communicating to customers and getting customers to do something, right? Like, use the product more, uh, whatever, upgrade, whatever it was that they were trying to drive the customer to do. Uh, that's how they were getting measured themselves internally. So that's where they were motivated, right? So like, I think a lot about like alignment, like uh, my, this is another, this is a different topic, but I think like now like all all like organizational problems are just alignment issues. Like meaning like, you know, you look at it like a sales rep and the sales rep is like um, bringing a lot of deals, but like a lot of those deals are churning. So you, instead of fixing that pr- the fundamental problem you say like oh we're gonna have clawbacks we're gonna have this we're gonna have fancy we're gonna have fancy math but the sales rep doesn't give a shit because like this month I'm getting comped on sales so yeah. I'm just gonna sell as much of this shit as I can uh, until you change the you try to change the alignment where like if they sell bad things and customers go away like there won't be an ability to add new customers for them and you can do that simply like with like territories they talk a lot about like old school thing like hey you can only sell in Austin so, like, if you burn and churn Austin, like, there's no more leads for you, hmm. right? Like, so that changes, this is a weird example, salesperson's alignment says, so like, oh, shit, maybe I should not be burning and churning through these people because I can only sell this area. How do, you, how do you organize all the different things you want to do? 
like your guys' roadmap and things? Is it spreadsheets, Asana? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, tactics. Uh, well, no, I'm just curious more, like, how do you do the buffer stuff, and then how do you do, like, the actual stuff you're going to do? Yeah, the uh, bunch of different ways. We let the, we did this at HubSpot, too. We ultimately, like, organize small three-person teams internally, and we let the teams really decide, like, where their organization is going to be. Right, instead of doing that company wide, so we do. So some people would end up using Trello, some people would use like uh, GitHub tickets, you know, like okay. whatever, you know, spreadsheet, blah 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 blah. The pro- my thing was like, I don't really care where it is, like because for each team they've got a different way that works for them, right? You have a different method than I have a yeah, method, sure. and so like uh, me saying like you can only use this one method because that's what I like. Yeah. Uh, is not that useful. All I care about is like, are you hitting the goals that we so have? So how do you guide them? So let them do whatever text they want. How do you guide them to the right direction? Like the alignment that we're talking about. How do you guide oh, okay. Them? From a feature standpoint? Yeah. Like from a higher level, like you're like, all right, this team, you know, you're responsible for this, you're responsible for this, but like, how do you make sure that they, that they're on the right path that you want them to be on? So the, with product, it's simply around the customer. So like this team is, I don't know how you divide teams, but like, no, I'd love to know how yeah. that's a thought. Or yeah. So let's say they own a portion of your product. Like, uh, so it's like email tools. Yeah. Email I mean, tools. Would it that's be easy. Tools or yeah, yeah. Be, okay. So like it's a, it's something that the customer can see that they think about as like part of your product, right? right. It's a discrete thing, right? It's not like a half of a setting or like a half of a screen. It's like email tools. Okay. They own email tools. All right. So how do you measure that teams being effective? You look at, I would look at the customer metrics. And, and measure those teams on those customer metrics. How many customers are using that tool? How many customers after 30 days, 60 days, mm-hmm. 90 days are using different features inside of email tools? For every new feature that you release in there, oh, how does the, each cohort, not only by time, but also by plan size, how much they're paying us, how are they using those tools, and are we basically increasing all of those cohorts over time? Uh, how does churn look like for email tools? email tool customers yeah uh and so and they're would, specialized interesting yeah and then and then have um the basic stuff that they would have as well what's downtime on email tools what's you know uh speed on email tools just from a performance standpoint um you know and then what's the retention stuff and then what's the activation stuff for email tools specifically and then you basically have that for each team and you're looking at week over week month over month and as long as those things are right, and I don't know what the numbers are, what the metrics are for you, but as long as those customer metrics are right, right, the customer is happier, they're using the tool more, they're paying you more money, then if they use Asana or TextPad or Notepad, like who gives a shit? Like it doesn't matter, right? Like, and what you're doing is giving that team autonomy to decide. I don't care if you fucking use Asana or Trello or write it on your fucking shoe. Like you have a goal. And we measure that goal, and everyone in the company sees that goal. So is it like you tri- did the goals trickle down? Like here's a company goal, and then here's yes. a goal that affects that goal, and then you have sub goals that'll tie totally. Up. But instead of having lots of company goals, it can be very simple, right? Like you have, we have a revenue goal. Right? Yeah, that's it. I don't care. I just want a revenue goal, and I, I want revenue with this kind of churn, right? And so like email tools, figure out how the fuck to do that. How do you right? get the revenue with this kind of churn? Yeah, and I'm gonna oh, measure everything that you do based on that. New features, existing features. How are they impacting that or not? Exactly. Oh. And so, like, you want to use whatever. To, I don't care. Who cares? Like, do you need to see the roadmap that they have? No. Like, who cares? Like, oh, really? No. We would have no roadmaps for that. No stuff. way, really? Totally. Yeah. That's why we had zero roadmaps. Yeah. So it was just more of like, here's your goal. Like, here's the revenue and churn goal, but more or less. Yeah. Maybe there's variations for different businesses. Totally. Here's the goals from customer goals that we're measuring for the team. And then here are like, from a strategic standpoint, here's some themes that we want to hit this year. That's not a roadmap. That's not like this feature will be released on this date, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's like, these are the things that we want to do. And then what we did was separate marketing events from product events, right? Because usually most companies would tie those together and say like, hey, you're going to release email tools next Tuesday. All right, we're going to market the shit out of it next Tuesday. And that's when all shit yeah. goes bad, right? Because it's like, well, they released it. It's fucking janky. It doesn't really work. We drove a lot of traffic to it. People are a little pissed off. You didn't give them a chance to have an iteration, iterations. And so we would set oh, marketing sure. goals that, and sometimes at HubSpot, like our marketing goals would be six months out after we had released something. People were using it already for six months. We never announced it to anyone, but they were already using it. And by the time we released it, now we had case studies. Now we had iterated the shit out of that thing when you like it was driving the metrics the right way. Oh, and then we did like ten iterations of it. That's when we did a big marketing push on that thing. Hmm, I like that. Yeah. So, so I, man, smaller teams, which is I think we need to do around a specific customer, customer goal. Thing, yep. Customer goal. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then I like that, just a longer beta period. Because I think we do that. I know it's assuming we're pushed out. That's what we did at Facebook. You push mm-hmm. it out, fix it right mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. Versus actually like getting it in, having a lot more beta people, longer time frame. Yep. Make sure it's like, you know, hitting the right goals. I like that. Totally. Especially when you're pushing stuff out to to paid users or to people who are increasingly paying you more. Like their tolerance for shit not working goes down. Yeah. It's different with when it's well, a free. free. Yeah, it's free. So people are more, more tolerant. Uh, but less so like email and stuff that fucks up their customer experience, yeah. right? <laughs> or takes down their website. I like whatever. that. That's yeah. really good. Yep. Thank you. No problem, man. It's fun. That was good. Yeah, that was really good. <laughs> I hope you all paid attention to that. <laughs> I was like taking that. Yeah. All right, we'll end with a couple uh, couple lighter ones. Well, not lighter, but uh, you guys were talking a lot about reading before. Mm-hmm. Um, What's a, a give us a book recommendation or like just talk about the book that's had the biggest impact on you personally or professionally or something? Well, we were talking in the beginning about readers versus non readers, mm-hmm. non rereaders. So there's people in the world who read a book once and there's people who read it many times. I mean, I read a book and personally, what I do, I don't know if it works for everyone, I always do a book report. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so I like, wanted to do that, I never it, do it. Uh, well, you can do it even lazier now. So, in the beginning with paper books, kids, I don't remember these. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to like bunny ear and then I'd try to underline it if I had a pen. If I didn't, I'd have to go back to the, after the book, I'd always go back and undo the bunny ear and write a note on that, whatever that yeah. section was. Mm-hmm. Now, with Kindle, you can just highlight. Yep. And then you can export your highlight to an article. Mm-hmm. And so then now I'll even put my articles on okdork.com. I'll mm-hmm. just export my book reports. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, not every book is worthy of a book report. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, some are, some aren't. Mm-hmm. I don't. Uh, you know what's funny? I think most things, one blog post or shit, no matter how great they are, like mm-hmm. def- a book is a blog post repeated 200 times. Yep. Right? And so almost n- zero times in my life, I, my life has really ever been changed by reading someone else's blog post. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think if you're looking for substantial and like sustainable change, like reading more books, I've seen consistently from successful yep. people. I mean, in terms of the books, there's so many, I don't know, I have a lot of different books for different parts. So I'll say like David, all of the above. Yeah. I mean, all of the somebody, above. Why do you do book reports? Uh, it's a way that I can remember and highlight the most important parts of the book because as we were talking about notes like me just the act of writing them down publishing them is more to share them because I'm like if I already wrote it maybe I'll make it easy for someone else to want to read mm-hmm. the book so I can make 45 cents on my Amazon affiliate link yeah <laughs> most importantly but you, most rarely, importantly, you rarely go back I never read not rarely notes. I don't read the never? notes I don't read the book yeah I skim the notes as I organize the art of the post but just the idea of writing them down, getting them out there for me, has helped me like solidify yeah. every book. Basically, you don't have more than two messages. Mm-hmm. Three, That's true. Three and a good one. Yep. You're not taking away yeah. more than that. Mm-hmm. Talk uh, about that. Yeah. Oh, Your I, thing I, about like people are like, I don't want to spend money on books or whatever. It's like you need one. You need to come away with one thing. Yeah. You one thing. One okay. Thing uh, uh, one idea. Oh, I, I got it. You know, stop the book or just uh, finish the book if you want. But you only need one thing. I think people are looking for a thousand things. Or like, uh, and then there just needs to be one thing that you can implement. All right, yeah, I got it. Whatever, that's it. Move on to the next thing. Are you a finisher, or are you? So there's two no. types of people as well. There's the finishers who have to finish the end, and then there's mm-hmm. like the like it's just not. It's not. We're not working out. Yeah, I used to be a finisher, so I did not read. Yeah, yeah. Did you change? Because I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, I would didn't want to read any more books because I didn't want to finish because I couldn't finish them. Okay, yeah, we should start a book club. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah so I'd be like, oh. that'd be awesome. Let's start a book club. But there's just things times because you start these books and like I notice I'll start watching more TV shows. Yes. Because I'm like, why am I watching more? Oh, because the book I read sucks. So sucks. like, how do I like fuck that book? Go back into fiction. Yeah. So I've been trying to even add more fiction to my life. Uh, it's just, I like that. Yeah, just oh. more. It's way more stimulating. And so I'll do like one to one like yeah. fiction. Like, what am I reading now? Now I'm reading. I haven't started a new one yet. Mm-hmm. Everything. What should I read next? Uh, I'll send you something. Uh, no. Let's, let's, yeah, so I just. Got, this oh, yeah. Recommendations. Yeah. So yeah. I just okay. So I just finished the goal last week. The yep. goals, have you read the goal? No. Nope, it's an Israeli guy. It's about operational efficiency. So mm-hmm. like how he took uh, – it's a it's like the E-Myth Revisited, which is a pretty good book. Yeah. But it's basically that for an operating, um, um, operating plan and how mm-hmm. you do an analysis of – you know, you have to create a goal and then how do you evaluate things to, to get the goal. And so through a live story of fixing a manufacturing plan. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was, it's, it's actually pretty quick. I would ignore all the parts we talked about his wife and his kids. It's just waste. Yeah. But the part about the story with the business is actually like not as fluffy and, and pretty interesting. Useful. Yeah, I haven't read a fiction book recently. Uh, I'm trying to think of one. But I've just been reading a lot of nonfiction. But what, are last, what are the last ones you've read? I'm, I'm in the middle book. of a bunch of one. I read, uh, kind of reminded me of what you're saying, this book called The Radical Focus, which mm. is... Uh, is that good? I wish this did. Yeah, it's is good. It? I liked it. For me. So I'll say it was for me because... Um, Radical Focus. It's basically just about OKRs, right? That's all it's about, right? But uh, OKRs never, um, I mean, I had a bunch of teams. I worked with a bunch of teams who've implemented it, and I never, 
really did shit for me, you know, OKRs. Like I didn't really, because yeah. I felt like, uh, like many other things, people got religious about it. Like they were, it was the process that they were religious about, not the results, not the mm. goal. It was just like, I'm doing this fucking process. Uh, and, uh, and so I didn't really care. And so I read this book by uh, Christina Watke. And uh, anyway, she tells the, she basically explains OKRs in a parable. So she tells a fake story, a parable, oh. like straight out of the fucking Bible. Called? Yeah, oh, I never knew what it's yeah, called. like straight out of the Bible, a parable, which is this just a story, and it's about some little startup or whatever, and how they went wrong, and then they went right, and then how OKR is kind of like got cool. in the line, and it was just like, oh, okay, I got it, because it was about this kind of company, uh, this thing that affected the company versus these kind of localized, you know, um, process shit. One thing you got me, I wonder, because a lot of times when you listen to interviews or podcasts or, you know, websites, it's like, what books are you reading? But I wonder how many people, like, besides they don't read them, they're not yeah. doing shit. But secondly, like, do you, would you rather recommend if you, you're going to say all the, I know what you're going to I was yeah, going to say, yeah. like, you know, as much as it's learning to read the books we're reading, they're all available to everyone else. Yep. But it's the actual experience of doing, doing. I'd almost say is more valuable than, than Way more. the books. Yeah, that's the part that, so I talk about books all the time and geek out with them all the time, but I think like what you said is probably one of the most important things which no one ever does, which is like, it's not, knowledge is interesting, it's useful, but if there's no doing, there's, yeah, it's not useful, right? Totally. Yeah, there's no application and most people are like, read, 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 do nothing, right? And so totally. I think the thing that separates what's most the, people. What's the last thing from the book that you've read that you've actually like then done? So many things. Uh, I have my book question. list. I know. I oh, Marie Kondo. The, well, I mean, the books that, like, stand out. about tidying up. Right? Yeah, so, like, I read Marie Kondo's Life, Changing Man, Tidy Up, and her follow-up book, Spark Joy, which is it literally is the yeah. same book. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just a different title. And so I went and, like, threw away, you know, probably half the stuff I have in my place, or mostly donated it. Um, that Ultimate Sales Machine, if you're looking how to sell. Yeah, chat. That I read book, that one from your post. Yeah, yeah that book is... It's like way undervalued, way mm-hmm. underappreciated. Mm-hmm. And I, I would say one book I'm actually going to reread, it's on my list for this year, is The Seven Habits. Yes. I'm actually, uh, right, third time. No, I'm, I'm rereading it. Yeah, yeah, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Damn. So good. So there must be, if, if you're a non rereader, then I got to read it. Oh, I've not read it? No. That's oh, like a God. Bible crazy? for business. Yeah, I, need That's it. The, I mean, but you live it because we talk about Stephen yeah. Covey's Big Rocks all the time. Yeah. His stuff is just yeah. so yeah. short. Or like the one, the one thing was the recent. Yeah, we read that as a company, The One Thing, which is uh, just like The Big Rocks, which is like double down, focus on one thing, getting one big thing done a day. And yeah. it's like if you do anything else, whatever, that's cool. Did you read Essentialism? No. The one thing, that got, the authors are here in Austin, so yeah. I am loyal to my Austin people. I enjoyed Essentialism more. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, way more it. than that. I thought okay. one thing was good. I'm not knocking it, yeah. but go check out Essentialism because yeah. it's even like, you know, and here's the thing. Everyone's heard a lot of the advice we would talk about or things mm-hmm. we're just sharing. Everyone's right. heard it. Yep. But for some reason, it's not internalizing. It's not like they're like, oh, the light went off. I've got to go do it. Maybe hearing it from us will. But yeah. I think with the, you know, with essentialism in that book, it's more of like, I think we do a lot of things in our day. Mm-hmm. What, you know, kind of to the one thing, like in your business, like you maybe you're doing four marketing channels. If you cut two of them, how much would that really impact the business? Mm-hmm. And what if you could do two of the ones you're doing that are working even twice as much? Yep. And I think we're, we're not willing to do the things that are painful or recognize, maybe go and mm-hmm. be aware of like, those are the two that matter. Mm-hmm. So, and I don't okay. say we're perfect at it. No, I think that's one thing when you're no. sharing stuff, you're like, well, I want to make sure I'm to a T and I have to be 100% consistency. No, I think of anything like being comfortable and not being perfect at stuff, which I'm comfortable. I know no, I know no is comfortable. I, I don't know, man. I just never want to be a hypocrite. Or, but it's, yeah. it's hard because like, yes, I used to have a lot of my mornings I'll, I won't read. I'll do, a, you know, I won't uh, check my email. I'll go yeah. read. I cook breakfast. I have coffee. And then I'll check my email at 1030. Yeah. But I don't do it every day. There's some days where I'm like, I'm looking forward to something in my email or I'm yep. just, you know, bored. And I think it's <laughs> That's trying to true. You're my, human. I am a human. Yeah. And as much as we want to be robots, we're not computers yet. Yeah. They're trying to be human and we're trying to be computers. Mm-hmm. I think that's the irony. Yeah, situation. that's right. <laughs> but I think what you said, which is, is true too, is like, how do you come back to some core principles or core mm-hmm. aspect or some reminder maybe? Yep. Like Maybe it's like a, a Buddha statue on your, on your kitchen table yeah. that brings you back to that. Oh yeah, I remember to do this in the morning. I remember to like, these are things that matter to me. That's why I just repeat the same shit all the time, which uh, Dave is <laughs> Dave here all the time. But most of it, and it it's works, just like though, in like, person, yeah. and uh, and also like when I do blog or when I do send out a tweet, they're almost a hundred percent to myself. Like I'm only talking to myself. Interesting. Like, like whatever it is, a quote or this or that, or like I'm just talking to myself, just trying to remind myself. 
uh, about like, just remember this, don't fuck this up again. Don't make that mistake again. Right. And we talk about like, uh, you know, just like double down, double down, double down, do you double write down. That out or, or I guess that's where you do the podcast to kind of share that stuff. So yeah. You, don't, you kind of like want it, it reinforces it. You're also getting it out there so that I don't know. Sometimes I know for me, I'll do a blog post on okay dork just cause I'm yeah. like, I don't want to forget this stuff. Like totally. how I get organized. I'm like, I just want to put it out there. What I don't have to answer it ever again. Mm-hmm. And it helps me kind of clarify the systems and ways that I'm living. Yeah. I, I think that's why we do. And I think the one thing that you mentioned before is like, the way that you learn, everyone learns differently, like with your note taking, like, uh, and you just have to figure out how do you learn. Some people are like note takers and then read by the act of reading their notes, they're learning. You, you're, you might be learning by just writing it, helps you learn it. Some people learn by saying it, right? And, you know, so it's like, are you a kinesthetic learner? Are you like, mm. you know, like, do you have to act through it to do it? Or are you like, can you be cerebral and just like read it and then like you've internalized this thing? I have to like repeat it. Like maybe because I'm, yeah, so slow. Learn. Yeah, yeah. No, one. Your vocabulary is great. You had cerebral. Yeah. <laughs> what was it? Parably. What's parable. What's, parable? What's kinesthetic mean? Kinesthetic means like um, uh, motion, like uh, the study of kinesol. I can't even pronounce kinesiology. it. Kinesiology. Kinesiology, yeah, right? So it's like it's like movement, right? So like yeah. some people are kinesthetic learners. Like um, it's like those people who are natural athletes. Like whatever. Like oh, I've never I've never played golf before, or never swung a bat before, and they pick it up and they're just like boom instantly. And it's like it's because they're like a kinesthetic learner. Totally. Right? They might not be they might not be great at reading. They might not be great at business, but they learn through movement. Totally. Right? Yeah. So so anyway, that's kinesthetic. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you, Noah. Bro. <laughs> All right. Now, we'll just end it with my favorite phrase. You guys can use this one. All right. Now. I just learned from my buddy. We're too blessed to be stressed. I love and that. We're so, too blessed. To, that's a mantra. Bro, that's the thing. Like my buddy Ben was telling me that. I don't know how he came up with it, but we're going to start spreading the word. Bro. I thought you were going to say like, oh, my buddy DJ Khaled said. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> bless up. Bless up is one thing. But it's just like, if you think about it all, like sometimes I'll just say that phrase. It's only been a few weeks, but I'm like, yeah, I'm too blessed to be stressed. And I'm like. Yeah. I'm going really to use that. Bro, I'm going to use that. Spread the word. Everyone right. listening, go spread that word. Tweet that stuff. Cool. Too blessed to be stressed. All right, now Noah's going to punish us with a workout. Oh, well, do, we, how much do you have time? time? I have got, yeah, we'll check it out after this. But. All right.